Hello? Hello, hello? <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, in, the, in today's uh, Insight Lecture. Uh, so I have been given a list of housekeeping items. So first, I would like everyone to switch off or silent your phones. Uh, please. Thank you. Uh, second, if we are less likely to have any fire alarm, but in case of a fire alarm, uh, please follow the stewards and uh, out of the building to the car park. Thank you. If you would like to tweet about today's event, please use hashtag insights and CL. Okay. After the lecture, you will have opportunity to ask questions. Thank you. So, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, today's speaker, uh, Roger Highfield. He is a writer and science journalist. He was born in Wales, grew up in London. He has been the first person to uh, bounce a neutron out of the soap bubble. So he has been a science editor in the Daily Telegraph for two decades. He, uh, he has also been uh, editor of New Scientist from 2008 to 2011. He is currently science director of the Science Museum Group. He is a um, fellow of Medical Academy. He is as well a professor uh, of public engagement in, at Oxford University at, and also at UCL. And finally, he is also a member of UKRI Medical Research Council. He has written eight books and thousands of articles in a wide range of magazines and newspapers. So, welcome Roger to the stage. And he's gonna, yeah, Roger's going to tell us a little bit more about a use of digital twins in medicine that's going to change our lives. So I hope you can enjoy the lecture. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's great to be here in Newcastle at the Insights Lecture. Um, and hopefully I'll give you a little bit of a glimpse of the future of medicine. Um, now, no matter how much doctors, your GP or whatever, uh, tell us that they want to treat us all as individuals, um, the current generation of medicine uh, is roughly speaking, not everything, but roughly speaking, one size fits all. Uh, much of current medicine is a bit like trying to drive down the road while looking in the wing mirror the whole time, because you're being treated uh, based on trials, on people done in the past who are a bit like you, in circumstances that may or may not be a bit like your circumstances. And, uh, you know, if you're elderly and unwell, <coughs> you often end up with a diagnosis that is really a, a fancy restatement of your symptoms with really no insight into what's going on at all. So really tonight what I want to do is talk about when medicine can actually gaze ahead out of the windscreen for the first time and use predictions of how not just anybody will behave, but your body will behave. So here's the outrageous book plug here. Um, it's a book I've been working on for the past few years with Peter Coveney of University College London. And here we sort of take the reader on a grand tour of a lot of science to show how we can come up with predictive medicine. And it's the first book on human digital twins. And I'd urge you all to rush out and buy a copy and get all your chums to buy one too. Um, now, Digital twins and digital copies of machines, even entire factories or cities, are already uh, helping us to anticipate hurdles, perfect designs, and prevent mistakes before they occur. But obviously tonight, I'm talking about trying to make digital twins of the most complex machine we know, which is the human body. Now, it might sound a little bit outlandish, this, but... Let me provide you with a little bit of context to explain why uh, there's growing confidence that digital twins of people will pay off in medicine. Now, this is an image of Earthrise from NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And we now actually have 
the first glimmer of digital twins of our planet, and they're already beginning to save lives. And I think because these sorts of very complex digital twins are already uh, paying off, I think we could be confident that digital twins of people can be just as useful. And let, let me just dig into what I, what I mean by this. So what is a digital twin? Well, to create them, you've got to capture the key processes and drivers of the climate system in mathematical form. And a typical forecasting model relies on a system of equations to simulate, in effect, whether it's going to rain or shine or whatever. These nonlinear differential equations, notably partial differential equations, rule the climate system. They're just differential equations just sum up change. And it takes billions of them to model the planet down to a resolution of about something like 60 kilometers at the moment. But we're aiming for single kilometer resolution by 2030. And when you animate these mathematical models on the computer, the model has to take account of all sorts of processes, thermodynamic, radiative, chemical processes, working on scales from hundreds of meters to thousands of kilometers, and over time scales from seconds to weeks. And that's a real tour de force of simulation. Um, and some people claim that approaches the complexity of what you need to model the human body. Actually, I, I wouldn't go that far myself, I have to say. Now, supercomputers um, can already make predictions a few days into the future with reasonable accuracy. And they do this by constantly updating these sophisticated computer models with data from orbiting satellites, from buoys, aircraft ships, weather stations, you name it. And as I mentioned, you know, plans are actually underway to create a digital twin of Earth. So that would simulate much more than just the climate system. I mean, it would look at, um, it would look at more details of the climate system, so ocean, ice, land, down to a resolution of a kilometer. So there you get forecasts of floods, droughts, fires along with the great swirling ocean eddies that shift heat and carbon around the planet. But this European model, Destination Earth, will fold in other data, such as energy use, traffic patterns, human movements, to actually try and get a, a glimpse of how climate change will affect society, and in turn, how society could affect the trajectory of climate change. Now, there's one thing we've got to be aware of uh, when we talk about the climate, and the same thing goes for the body, and that is chaos and the butterfly effect. And this was discovered in the early 60s when Ed Lorenz at MIT was simulating the Earth's atmosphere in a really primitive model. It was just three coupled ordinary differential equations. These were simplified, they're called Navier-Stokes equations. And they describe convection, the kind of thing, movement of fluid that you get in a hot cup of coffee, for example. Um, but when he repeated his first simulations, he got completely different results after a while. And what he found is that um, when he'd run the simulations again, he'd slightly rounded the numbers. And in rounding the numbers, although the simulation started off the same, it became very, very different. You know, you might expect that a small difference, a small error in feeding in your numbers would lead to a small difference. But in fact, he got wildly diverging results, even in a change in one last decimal place in his numbers. So chaos rules the weather too. And to deal with it, we have to use something called ensemble methods, where you put in a whole load of different starting conditions and values of uncertain parameters, which you don't quite have a handle on. You feed them into your models, and then you cover a whole range of possible expected weather events. So, um, you know, whether it's going to rain or whatever. So one run of a code that's really exquisitely sensitive to its initial conditions will give you different answers from the next. But when you do an ensemble, you do hundreds of hundreds of calculations, you can get quite reliable averages. And when you look at forecasts up to 10 days in the future, you can see um, that small events can actually have big impacts in several day days' time. But actually, we can forecast the general feel of the weather to a relatively high uh, degree of accuracy for about five days and beyond on the scale of the UK um, as a whole. 
So these digital twins are already saving lives. Marcus Cover of Stanford University is one of the people we talked to in the book who's developed uh, virtual cells, um, remarked that prediction of storms 10 days in advance of landfall, where you could actually evacuate people in time and so on. He argues this is one of the great technical triumphs in human history. We don't really take it, we sort of take it for granted, but it's an amazing feat. And none of that could be done if we didn't possess mathematical representations of the relevant natural phenomena. And in virtual you, we argue that we really need the same now for biology and medicine. We need more theory uh, and more mathematical understanding, uh, which can be translated into computer models and solved. And of course, it's got to be reliable and reproducible. Now, I don't want to underestimate the challenge of building a digital twin of a human. Um, here are a few numbers just to sum up how mind-bogglingly complicated each one of you is. Um, I've said we're the most complex object we know. Um, the human brain, the wiring of which is shown here, is extraordinarily complex. And you know we're used to some of the statistics, 20,000-ish protein encoding genes, 90,000 proteins. 650,000 protein-protein interactions, 40 trillion cells, give or take some, three times more microorganisms, such as microbes, unless you've just been to the loo, of course, and so on and so forth. Um, so I've been talking, there's Peter Coveney there standing uh, next to me on the right. Peter and I have been talking about virtual humans for several years and we had a great event in the Science Museum a few years ago with some of the experts in the field. Um, but in fact, the, although it sounds sci-fi and futuristic, in fact, digital twin research in medicine, you can trace the roots back a long, long way, back to the 50s, um, when thanks to the conveniently large uh, nerve fibers of the squid, Britain's Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley won the Nobel Prize for honing a groundbreaking mathematical theory behind the action potential. These are the nerve impulses that go down nerves. And not only had they uh, created a very successful mathematical model of a complex biological process, the model was confirmed by subsequent detailed molecular studies, and actually the model helped give pave the way for deeper insights into how nerve excitation took place. So there's nothing more satisfying, I think, in science than finding out that the theory built on experimental observations can pave the way to these sort of deeper insights. And we argue in the book, in a way, they sort of lit the blue touch paper for virtual you. Now, clearly, when it comes to building virtual you, we need data. And there's all sorts of structured, what we call structured data sets that are routinely gathered about patients in the form of you know, temperature, uh, blood tests, urine tests, and so on. There's a plethora of genetic data as well. There's lots of big genomics uh, programs in the UK. And of course, we're celebrating the 70th of the double helix paper this week. Um, at the molecular level, there's lots of information about the shape of proteins, the sites on proteins, or other molecules in, in interact. You can summon up tons of information on proteomics, um, metabolism with metabolomics and so on. There's a load of scanning technologies, X-ray, MRI, you name it. And then there's a whole sort of tsunami of unstructured data as well. People are beginning to gather lots of data on smartphones. So I remember meeting a chief scientist at Nokia who said that he could tell how happy populations were by looking at the accelerometer in their smartphones and see how, seeing how jauntily they walked, you know, and if they kind of slopped along, they were miserable, and if they had a spring in their step, they were happy and so on. And people are beginning now to look at, could you build a digital phenotype for people? So rather than waiting for a mental health crisis, can you see spot, subtle signs in their digital phenotype of trouble ahead? Now, AI, of course, will have a role in building virtual you. And we've already had a remarkable story, the grand challenge of uh, finding a way to turn one kind of data, which is the sequence of amino acids um, in a protein. These are the basic building blocks in a protein. 
into another, which is the protein shape, which really governs the way that it works. Um, remarkably, a couple of years ago, AlphaFold, uh, DeepMind's AI, showed a way to, to do this. And I think it is probably the most important use of AI in um, contemporary science. But equally, um, we make it clear in the book, we shouldn't get too carried away about AI. Some poor so-and-so has got to check all these predictions. These are static crystal structures. In fact, there was a great paper uh, or comment out this week by Comfort and Cobb about the Rosalind Franklin's contribution to DNA. And what it showed was she was very interested in one form of DNA, which is the crystal structure, which is what AlphaFold is looking at. And Watson and Crick were very interested in the wet form, which is actually the way it really appears in the human body. And so although we're getting loads of these static crystal structures, they don't actually look necessarily like the ones, uh, the way that the, the proteins look in our cells and so on. And of course, there's still a ton of work left to unlock the science, you know, the essential biology, chemistry, and physics of why and how uh, proteins fold. Another um, key ingredient of virtual you um, is our ability to kind of put the spark of life into mathematical equations. And that's been transformed in recent years by the rise of high-performance supercomputing or supercomputers. And we're moving from what's called the petaflop era to the exascale machine. So exascale means three orders of magnitude better than their petascale predecessors. So these computers will be uh, uh, able to do a million, 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 or a billion, billion floating point operations per second. So that's one followed by 18 zeros. So if you if you wanted to match what an exascale machine can do in one second, um, you'd have to perform a calculation every second for, uh, well, something approaching 32 billion years. Now, this next generation of supercomputers is beginning to wink into life. There's a lot of argument about whether the Chinese have hit the exascale or not. They're slightly secretive about what they've done. Um, but we do know that Frontier in the States is definitely uh, exascale. And in fact, we're already thinking about how do you get to Zeta and Yotta scale machines and so on. Not trivial because these are so energy hungry. This, this, these machines use as much energy as a small town and there's some serious problems ahead to overcome. But even so, even with petascale machines, um, you know, we can already do some cool things. So Peter Coveney, my co-author, uh, gave a glimpse of how you can tailor cancer treatments to a patient using Supermuck. It's not a very elegantly named machine. Um, it's at the Leibniz Supercomputing Center near Munich, and it's a cluster of two linked supercomputers. It's got 250,000 computing cores in all, so that you can think of a computing core like, like your regular PC. And that gives you 6.8 petaflops, that's 10 to the power of 15 uh, power. And, and they, they, um, normally you don't get access to the whole machine because research groups are fighting over these machines the whole time to use them. Um, but during a service outage, they gave Peter's team access to the whole machine for 37 hours. So that's something like a quarter of a million people beavering away on everyday personal computers. That sort of gives you a sense of the kind of computational power we're talking about. And during a day and a half, they studied how 100 drugs and candidate drugs bind with their protein targets. And to put it simply, you know, the, the better the binding, the more potential they had for drug <coughs> development. And I mentioned ensembles beforehand. Chaos is an important thing to think about here. They used ensembles just like the ones I mentioned for weather forecasting where they could predict what's called the binding affinity with very high degree of precision. And they found they could predict these binding affinities within a few hours. So this is a key thing. It's an actionable prediction, because medicine and biology is full of people telling you why something worked three years after it's happened. And that's no good if we're going to use digital twins of people. So um, they've also used a similar approach for breast cancer. Um, which is linked with high levels of the hormone estrogen in one particular case. And in that study, Peter's team found a novel variant 
novel variants of the estrogen gene and reception, a group of 50 Qatari breast cancer patients, and could again suggest which cancer drugs would work for these patients and which would not. So clearly, you know, the drug model of drug development is a bit broken at the moment. You know, uh, billions of dollars, more than a decade for a drug. And clearly, if you can do virtual drug screening, you can become much more productive. You can boost the drugs tested by orders of magnitude just for a given outlay. Um, this is a bit of an awful slide, so apologies for this. But we argue that actually you need, AI can be very useful, but um, because AI can give you rubbish, it's only as good as your training data. Actually, we, we argue for something that we call big AI, a blend of AI and the kind of theory, mechanistic understanding that I've been talking about, where we think that um, you can test AI hypotheses in a physics-based simulation based on how the real world works, and then you use the physics-based methods to, to train AI and so on. And in a recent study with an international team, uh, he's presented a novel in silico method, method for drug design using a combination of these theory-based methods with machine learning to make um, the former nimbler and the latter smarter. And so the sort of thing they've done is to look at um, one of the key protein components of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, something called the, the main protease, and that enables the virus to reproduce. And obviously, you want to find a way to nobble it. So this is a quick way. You know, the hope is to come up with pandemic drugs at pandemic speed. Uh, we've got a colleague, um, Rick Stevens, in the States, who works on something called Aurora, which will be another exascale machine. He's led an American team that's used a similar big AI approach um, to sift more than six million molecules to find a promising inhibitor of the protease. So in this way, you can see how digital doppelgangers of patients, you can see little elements of how they, they will um, herald the dawn of really personalized medicine, where you're doing virtual drug trials on thousands of digital twins. And only when a drug, uh, and you're, you're only selecting a drug that works for them rather than the usual experiences. You go to the doctor, they give you one drug, it doesn't work, they try another drug, and that could be months later. <coughs> and what's nice is uh, one of those people on slide I showed you earlier, uh, Blanca Rodriguez at Oxford, it has already shown that you can get more accurate results from human digital heart twins than you can from animal research. Uh, this is a virtual cell a virtual mycoplasma genitalium, which is a very sim simple bacterium. But it's thrived in a computer thanks to the systems biologist Marcus Kovert, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, he used the mycoplasma DNA code with data gleaned from about 900 papers, including about 2,000 uh, experimentally determined parameters that looked at the genetic code, the transcriptome, proteome, metabolome, and so on, lots of ohms. And they carved up um, this very simple bug into 28 functional processes, and they modeled each one independently over a one second time scale. And they could figure out interesting things. You know, 90% of the gene genes had been used or expressed within the first, and they're weirdly specific, 143 minutes of the cell cycle, that there were 30,000 interactions between proteins during each cell cycle. And they could even simulate the effect of disrupting uh, each one of the 525 genes in this very simple organism in thousands of simulations. Um, Craig Venter used to obsess about this. What's the minimum uh, set of genes for life? They reckoned that it, there are 284 genes that are essential to sustain this organism and that 117 are non-essential. And the nice thing is they roughly corresponded with experiment. So Peters, my co-author, has worked with his group at UCL and Amsterdam, along with the Foundation for Research on Information Technologies uh, in Society, that's in Switzerland, and others to recreate in silico um, the um, blood supply, the blood circulation. This is a 60,000 mile long network of vessels, artery, arteries, veins, and capillaries. 
And to do this, they relied on South Korea's visible human program. So they used billions of data points from a digitized human uh, built from uh, high resolution cross sections of the frozen cadaver of a 26 year old Korean woman, Yoon Sun, who donated her body um, to medicine. And Peter's team was able to create a virtual copy of Yoon Sun's blood vessels down to a fraction of a millimeter across. There are actually even finer ones than that. And again, by taking over Supermuck um, for several days, they could show in a realistic way how blood flowed around um, her digitized body for about 100 seconds. And you can begin to use this um, digital twin of the circulation to look at detailed um, variations in blood pressure across the body, uh, to see how they correlate with different kinds of disease, look at movement of blood clots and things like that. Um, probably the most um, advanced digital twin models in medicine are hearts. So um, at King's College London, for example, Steve, Stephen Niedra is using image-based cardiac models to guide where to put pacemakers on hearts. And he creates virtual cohorts of patient hearts in silico, so in the computer, to test therapies and devices. And I find it striking that you know, you've got regulatory agencies like the FDA in the States beginning to accept uh, in silico data. And you've got commercial cardiac software now being rolled out by people like Dassault, and that's what we're showing here, and the American company ANSYS. So this is going now beyond the laboratory and becoming a real thing. Um, we can create virtual breaths too. So at Imperial College, my neighbors, you've got Dennis Dawley uh, working with Mariano Vasquez at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center showing how when we take a sniff, air is drawn through our nose and undergoes through sort of various accelerations and decelerations. You can look at where inhaled drugs end up in the lungs or pollutants end up in the lungs and so on. Uh, Marco Vicaconti at the Universities of Bologna in Sheffield and Alberto Marzo at the University of Sheffield have used models to show how to predict the risk of bone fracture in elderly patients. And these, we're talking about patients with osteoporosis when aging bones lose their ability to regenerate, so they become brittle. Obviously, the brain is like the grand challenge um, in the virtual human. Um, and even here, um, there are clinical applications of this approach. So the virtual brain is an open source simulation platform, again, blending uh, brain data um, with predictions, and it's been under development for about the last decade or so by Victor Yersa at A. Marseille University. And they're beginning to use it to treat epilepsy, which affects about 50 million people worldwide. You can often control the seizures with drugs, but about a third of patients are drug resistant. And the only option is for surgeons to remove the epicenter of these seizures that's where it first emerges in the brain and then spreads. To help clinicians plan this difficult surgery, the virtual brain team creates a personalized brain model of patients and simulates the spread of abnormal activity during seizures to help pinpoint exactly which bit of brain tissue's got to be removed. And this has already been, well, when I last checked, has been tested on 350 patients in 13 French hospitals. Of course, you know, up to now I've talked about basic digital twins of various elements of the body. Um, we're now talking about linking up a virtual heart with a virtual circulatory system. So Peter Coveney is working with a team um, in Barcelona. I think that's the Alia Red um, heart model. So famous now, even Dan Brown mentioned it in one of his uh, books. Um, and so you can start to use a virtual heart to pump virtual blood around virtual arteries. And the hope is that with the rise of exascale computing, the ability to model the complexity of the body and the brain is, are going to make great strides. And actually, one of the things I've sort of skated over here is there's different, different theories often apply and different kinds of physics often apply at each level in the body. And you're using different theory at the molecular level 
from, say, that that you're using to model the flow of blood around a heart. And one of the great technical challenges is stitching together what's called a multi-physics, multi-scale model. But I think that, um, you know, there's no end, I think, to what we can already see a future ahead where these things are beginning to have value. And what's also interesting is there are new kinds of computers just around the corner um, that could um, accelerate virtual you as well. Uh, this is Sycamore, uh, which is uh, Google's quantum computer. And in 2019, um, they announced that they'd achieved the feat of quantum advantage, or it used to be called quantum supremacy, um, where the claim was this machine could do something that a classical computer, the kind that you use, couldn't do easily, or it would take a long, long time. Um, and it relies on supercomputing circuits, and they conduct electricity without resistance at low temperatures. Um, they had a modest number of what are called qubits, just 53 on their Sycamore processor, but they reckoned that it could ta tackle what the Summit supercomputer at Oak Ridge would take millennia to do. There's actually been a lot of argument about this because actually IBM proposed that there's a, 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 a way to frame the calculation that would enable a so-called classical supercomputer to perform the task Google's quantum computer completed um, in a reasonable time. But then we had in 2022 a Chinese team um, uh, having a, uh, well, they, they claimed that an exaflop machine running its algorithm would be faster than the quantum computer. So there's still a, Peter actually uses quantum computers. They're not very good at the moment. But if they do fulfill their potential, they could be hugely uh, important, for, particularly for simulating molecular processes in the body. Um, one thing I've sort of assumed in all of this is that we're using digital computers. Um, and just to go back to that mention of Ed Lorenz's work where he discovered chaos, where little roundings would have big effects, um, there are some technical things we have to worry about to do with how much we can actually believe digital computers. Um, and basically, uh, if you're modeling something that is chaotic, sometimes using uh, floating point numbers, which are the kinds of numbers that computers use, just strings of zeros and ones, um, there, by translating analog reality into, say, single precision floating point numbers, there's only four billion of them, and they're kind of weirdly unevenly distributed as well. You do risk problems with chaos, just as Lorentz found. I, I don't want to go into all the gory details, but actually, um, Peter's done work with a team in Oxford looking at a very simple example of chaos called the Bernoulli map, where you can come up with an exact mathematical solution. So you know what the answer is, and that's, that, that's not always the case, often not the case, in fact. And then you can compare the mathematical reality with what computers predict. Um, and what's slightly shocking is computers can give you completely the wrong answer. Um, ensembles can help. And so can analog machines. And here's my favorite analog machine ever, the Antikythera mechanism, um, a sort of hand-cranked computer, two millennia old analog machine that could mimic the movements of the heavens. Um, probably the oldest mechanism we have for predicting the future. I'm not proposing that we use hand-cranked mechanisms um, in the next generation of supercomputers but more that we're using an analog machine that would run on light. And I mentioned quantum advantage earlier. Um, there was a great example of quantum advantage reported in China in 2020 using a room temperature quantum computer. Um, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this properly, but it's uh, Zhui Zhang Shanshu. Nine chapters on a mathematical art is, is the translation. It's a classic early Chinese mathematical work. And it was developed by a team at the University of Science and Technology of China in Hefei. And the quantum computer cracked a problem that again seemed beyond classical computers. It's an analog machine. Uh, this time they were comparing it with a supercomputer called Fugaku. Uh, at that time, it was the world's um, most powerful classical computer. 
and it would take 600 million years to accomplish what this quantum machine could do in just 200 seconds. So, um, you know, the key thing is this is an analog machine, unlike Sycamore. So again, we argue in the book, not least because digital computers are colossally power hungry when you build them at this scale, that we've got to start looking again at analog computing, low energy um, sort of uh, analog computing. So, um, you know, the vision is that over the next couple of decades, it's going to be possible to try, conduct a trial on a digital copy of you rather than infer your possible fate based on the basis of previous trials and other people who bear a passing resemblance to you. In fact, you could even see trials being done on many virtual versions of you to look at the impact of things like diet, medication, lifestyle, environment. With enough computational power, life can be sped up to, chair the, the long, ch to chart the long-term effects of a novel drug on aging or quality of life, and so on. Um, and the hope would be, and again, it's a matter of stripping down these models so you just get the important stuff. If you do a molecule up simulation of the human body, it would take thousands of years, millennia, to run in a supercomputer. But the hope is that um, these kind of digital doppelgangers could be born and age and die on a supercomputer within a few hours to actually give us an insight not only to how to treat things but also how to prevent illness as well. Um, and I think actually probably the easiest way just to give you a glimpse of some of the things that are going on is to show a little film that we produced with the Barcelona Supercomputing Centre. It's only six minutes, so don't panic. But it gives you, it's a sort of summary of where we were a couple of years ago. And you can see some of the things I've mentioned and a few more, just to give you a more vivid sense of, of the simulations. I mean, you get a little hint here. You know, again, um, thinking of that classic Watson Crick paper, the double helix. Um, you know, it was the wet version of the so-called so B form of DNA. And it's very important to see the molecules in our bodies as dynamic things. They're not. So this is a movement of a mutated protein uh, in, implicated in cancer. And here, we're looking at some of the um, simulations as a drug molecule there, trying to figure out how well it docks with the site. Now, people often used to talk about a lock and key analogy, that a drug was like a key to go with a certain um, site in the body. But it's more complicated than that, because your, your key is wobbling around and your lock is wobbling around, and there are charges all over these molecules too. And again, here's the Dennis Dawley work, uh, looking at virtual breaths, and seeing, um, again, how particles, drugs, uh, allergens, whatever you're interested in, um, go into the body. I should say, the Barcelona guys, that they've made it look so slick. It looks like just another Hollywood CGI. But it isn't just another Hollywood CGI. This is actually based on uh, real data, real simulations, and so on. Um, here we are, model of human male arteries used to simulate blood pressure during one cycle. 
Um, yeah, the circle of Willis connects two arteries of the brain, and again, you can start to model the flow of, uh, of blood through these things. So if you're planning a delicate operation, this could be very useful if you're putting in a stent and, and so on. Um, so when, when we make digital twins, so here's a stent going in to support an artery. Um, often you're taking a sort of off-the-shelf digital model of something, and then you're customizing it to the patient with a lot of patient data. And as I say, there are now some really um, impressive digital twins of human hearts that really are just like the patient's um, heart. And it goes back to work by Dennis Noble in Oxford. So I think this is the Alia Red simulation plus a bit of Hollywood, um, uh, a bit of a Hollywood treatment looking at the, so they've had to simulate lots of processes here because obviously the heart, there's spreads of electrical way activity around the heart, but it's also very much a mechanical pump as well. Uh, there's, a, there's a fluid flow simulation through the heart and so on. So you've got to uh, integrate lots of different modeling. But back in the 60s, Dennis Noble took that Hod Hodgkin Huxley model um, of the nerve cell and he came up with the first digital heart cell running on a cranky old computer in Bloomsbury. We'd have to run his simulations. You know, it took him ages just to simulate one heartbeat. Um, here again is um, looking at the, the forces on the body during, uh, just during walking, I was going to say during locomotion. That's classic scientist speak, forgive me. Um, again, looking at the simulating the stresses on various bones and so on uh, with these kind of simulations. And this harks back to the kind of engineering heritage of a lot of digital twin research. You know, the engineers have been using digital twins for years and years and years. Why aren't they used more often in, uh, in medicine and biology? Because partly because it's horrifically complicated and partly because there's actually real sort of um, resistance to theory and so on, probably because theory didn't work very well for a very, very long time. Um, and this final um, section was just talking, oh, we've lost it completely now. I don't know what's happened there. There we are. And then there's just uh, the various credits there's Peter and me, and there's the Barcelona guys. There's a whole cast of thousands involved in doing this, actually. Um, but the nice thing is that it did summarize uh, work published in a whole load of papers by a whole load of different teams, as you can see here, um, just to show that it, this is not, um, there's a huge amount of digital twin research going on already in lots of different countries. So let me um, just see if I can, oop, now I don't know how to get back to the, how do I get back to the presentation? There we go. Lots more people to thank. Um, this is a classic scientist outro slide, a sort of, you know, <laughs> shocking kind of dog's dinner of logos and so on, so apologies for that. Any questions? Sorry, I should, I should have given you some epic outro, like, I hope you have glimpsed the future of medicine. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you.